Stayallday.com. You're now tuned into the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and authentically, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you're going to use those personal initiative. That is, go get an energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go and make things happen instead of waiting for things to happen. And then we put all this together into a series of frameworks, approaches, insights, strategies, and techniques all underneath the umbrella of one unified philosophy that is called Work on Your Game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic is, we are going into a two-part mini-series on the keys to selling. Uh, before we get into this, I remind you all of two things. First of all, my daily motivation and Monday motivation text messages guaranteed to help you focus sharp and on point, respectively, every month, every day and every week. All you got to do to get those, once we start sending them out again, that is, is to be in my texting community. You can join now by texting me at my number, 305-384-6894. Once we start sending those messages again, you'll be getting them straight to your phone. Secondly. Work on your game university. If you are a person who is a top 2% performer or you plan on being one or you were there, maybe you fell off a little bit or maybe you see yourself on the way, but you would like to get there faster and more efficiently, go to workonyourgameuniversity.com. You can see what our program is all about. See how you can get to work with me directly. You can schedule a time to get in a conversation with us where we can find out if we can help you, if you'd be a good fit for what we're doing, and then we take it from there. Again, that's all at workonyourgameuniversity.com. That link is down below in the description to this episode. Of that out the way, let's get right into the topic, which again, part one was going to be a two part series on the keys to selling. Now, I thought of this subject when I was thinking about people. I'm thinking about specifically people who sell high touch offerings. So, I mean, products and services where you are continually working with the people who buy from you, even after the sale is made. So, if you do something like a landscaping job at someone's house or you sell coaching, after you make that sale, you are still dealing with the person who has bought from you. All right, this is not like a one-off sale, like you sell someone a, a slice of pizza or you sell them a, a thumb drive or you sell them uh, a pair of socks. All right, They buy from you, they leave, and you never have to deal with them again. And they never have to deal with you again, even though they can continue using the product. I'm talking about high touch selling, the keys to this kind of selling, because there are specific ways that you sell depending on what you're selling and to whom you are selling. So that's the group that I'm talking about here in this mini series. So in this conversation, I want to help you understand who to sell to and what type of people you want to aim for when it comes to your clientele and your customers. So this first part here, we're going to talk about people who you're going to sell to. And then actually, that's what we're going to talk about. This is this whole two part series is about because there are uh, several points here that I couldn't even fit them into one episode. So point number one topic, once again, is sales keys. When we're talking about who you want to sell to, who do you want to sell to? What type of people you want to target? When you're selling because this does matter you do not want to sell to just anyone and everyone when you're doing high touch selling because again you have to continue to deal with these people after the sale is made so you need to be very careful and choosy about who you choose to sell to because if you sell to the wrong people then the what is going to cost you to service those accounts are not worth the money that you make understand point number one as i get into these points you'll understand this very well point number one Topic once again is keys to selling, who to sell to. Sell to people who have money. Sell to people who have money. Some other people will say this in a different language, but we're all saying the same thing. People will say sell to people who are rich. Yeah, sell to the rich. Sell to people who are rich, financially rich. I'm not talking about any kind of other kind of rich. Sell to people who are financially rich, however you define that term. Other people will go in the opposite direction and they'll frame it same point, but from the opposite direction, they'll sell, do not sell to people who are broke. Don't sell to people who don't have money. Now, why am I making this the first point? Why does this matter? Why should you sell to people who have money? Why does it matter how much money a person sells to when you sell to them? Well, for one, they had to actually be able to afford your product, but let's assume they can afford it. Let's assume every person we're talking about here can afford your product. You're, I'm saying that you're better off selling to people who have a lot of money and people who only have a little bit of money, people who can barely afford your product and people who can afford your product 100 times over. You're better off selling to the person who can afford your product 100 times over than the person who is spending the last of what they have in their account in order to buy from you. Why is this? This is a simple concept, but why it doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you why, because for you, it's the same amount of money, right? So if your product costs $2,000 and there's someone who has $200,000 of discretionary income and they're giving you 2,000 of it, they still have 198,000 left. Then there's another person who all they have to their name is $2,000, but they're willing to give you the 2,000 because they want your product bad enough. For you, it's the same amount of money. It's $2,000 no matter who it came from. I I'm telling you why it matters to get it from the person who has a whole lot more money. And this point that I'm gonna share with you here is often violated by many salespeople. I have made the mistake of violating this point even myself at times. 
And the reason that we tend to violate this point is because just a simple reason we tend to focus on collecting the money rather than who the person is who is giving us the money. And that is a mistake. To focus on collecting the money over who you're actually getting the money from is a mistake. The person who you're getting the money from matters just as much as, if not more than, the amount of money itself. Why? Because, oh, let me give you a little bit more, then I'll tell you why. You want to sell to people who actually have money. You want to sell to people who have more money than even what you're asking them for. And why is this? Because selling to people who don't have money, first of all, is going to be harder to make the sale because there's a lot more back and forth you got to go through and a lot of hoop jumping you and they have to do. And sometimes you're even getting into negotiating and trying to help them figure things out because they don't have money. You have to do a lot of hand wringing and you're basically trying to squeeze, squeeze water out of a stone in order to get money from people who don't have lots of it. Are you rather you're better off selling to people who have money? So uh, it's no struggle for you to actually get the money because they have it. It's no struggle for them to figure out where they're going to get it from because they already know where it's at. You will find yourself when you're selling to people who don't have money unable to close sales, not because there's anything wrong with your selling skills necessarily, or that anything is wrong with your offering again necessarily, but simply because you are talking to people who just can't afford to buy from you. So no matter how great your presentation is. And no matter how great your product is, if you're talking to people who can't buy it, it doesn't matter what you do in your presentation because you cannot turn a frog into a prince. If they don't have money, they don't have money. If your product costs $2,000 and they only have $100 to their name, they can't buy it. All right, it doesn't matter what you say. All right, so there's nothing wrong with you. And it may not be anything wrong with your product. What's wrong is you're talking to a person who can't buy from you, that they don't have the money. All right, there's nothing you can do to change that situation for the most part on a, on a, a simple vacuum level uh, position. Nothing you can do to change that situation. So let me ask a question. Wouldn't it be easier if every sales conversation you had was, was with someone who could financially afford to buy what you're selling? Wouldn't your sales process be a lot easier if every person you talk to could afford to buy what you're selling? For me, I'll answer that myself. The answer is hell yes. Because if every single person I talk to could afford to buy what I'm selling, guess what I will know for sure? That if someone says no to me, it's not because of the money, it's because of something else. Either they didn't trust me, either they didn't, my presentation wasn't good, or maybe they didn't believe in the product or the service, but I know it wasn't the money. And I don't want to have a conversation with a person who the reason that they end up not buying my product is they simply don't have the money. I don't even want to get in a conversation with them in the first place because I should have screened them out before we even got there. That's the point. That's what this first point is about. You don't want to be in conversations about selling a product to people who can't afford to buy your product because, again, there's nothing you can say that's going to change what's in their pockets if there's nothing there. See, if you're doing that, talking to people, and when I say that, I mean talking to people who actually do have money. You look at your sales results and determine if there is something that needs to be fixed when it comes to your sales conversations and your offerings, rather than being in the dark about whether or not the person, i.e. your prospect who might be broke, if they're the issue. See, if you talk to people who have money, then the person you're talking to is never the issue. It eliminates a variable, basically, is what it does. It eliminates the variable of, well, they just didn't have money. And now you can isolate the variable down to, okay, it was something about my presentation, something about me, or something about my offer that caused them to say no. And now you can eliminate the variable of it. They just didn't have the money because you know they have the money. Right, get it? So you want to eliminate as many variables as possible at any time that you're uh, making decisions based on data. So anytime you can eliminate a variable and you can isolate the main thing that you want to focus on, that's better. You want to do that as much as possible because now you can make a measured decision that you know is based on a specific truth, not based on a guess that you're making. Because The more variables you have, the more you have to guess as to which variable is causing the issue. Point number two. Today's topic, once again, is the keys to your sales process, who to sell to. Number two, sell to people who buy based on value, not based on price. Based on value, not based on price. The second point is usually in direct alignment with the first point. How so? I'll tell you how. Because people who have money, meaning they have money that they can afford to, they have enough money such that they can afford to buy whatever you're selling. They make their buying decisions based on the value of what they are buying, not based on whether or not they can afford it. You see, if someone's making a buying decision based on whether or not they can afford it, then you don't know if they value your thing or not, or if even if they say that they don't, it might just be because they don't have money, right? So they're telling you one story, but that's not the actual story. Again, this is why we eliminate these variables. See, there you want people who make buying decisions based on, all right, I can't afford this. Is this a matter of who am I going to buy it from, or do I even value what this is? What this is going to cost me. This way, again, you're looking at your outcomes based on your the quality of your offering and how you're communicating it, and making sure that you're communicating the proper value to the people you're talking to. 
Those are your prospects. If your prospects are if the prospects you're, talk, prospects you're talking to simply do not have money, they are ineligible to make a value judgment because they're not in a value judgment position. So you can't be in a value judgment position if you don't have the money to look at something based on value. You're looking at things based on price because you don't have money. See, those people are not in a position to tell you whether your thing is valuable or not because they couldn't afford it even if it was. And even though they may think it is, but they may tell you a different stories to save face because of the fact that they don't have any money. See, this is what the position that you don't want to be in. You don't want to be playing this guessing game. And again, if you're a salesperson, why would you want to sell to people who don't have money anyway? All right, because here's a couple of things you should understand about people who have money is that they tend to value the things that they buy a little bit more than the people who don't have money. They also tend to make the most of the things that they buy because that's probably one of the reasons why they got to having money in the first place. And also, they will be a lot less of a headache than the people who don't have money. All right, trust me, you can learn this the hard way if you want, or you can take my word for it. People who don't have money who buy from you are the biggest headaches of everybody you sell to, even though you would think is the people who have money who would be the biggest headaches is actually not. No, it's the people who don't have money who are the biggest headaches. Why? Because they are so emotionally connected to the money that they don't have that they are basically trying to squeeze every penny out of you because they gave every penny that they had to you. So they are looking at you as almost as responsible for the money that they now no longer have. They didn't have that much to begin with. They're looking at you as responsible for it because they didn't have much money when they bought from you in the first place. This is why it's not worth it to sell to people who are broke. Because they're going to take that same anxiety that they have over money and they're going to project it onto you. And why are they going to do this? Because they gave you the money. They gave you a little bit of money that they had. So now they're putting it all on you to solve the problem of them not having money, even though they may not say it in so many words. This is exactly what ends up happening. So you don't want to deal with these people. This is why you don't want to sell to people who don't have money. Sell to people who actually have money. So when you're I'm still on point number two here, when you're talking to people who don't have money, they're making a decision based on money that they don't have then this is not a reflection of you or your product or your selling ability, even though, again, it may be verbalized that way. It is a reflection, however, on your marketing. All right. This is where if you find yourself, any of you who's in sales, you find yourself talking to a lot of broke people, people who just don't have money and they cannot afford to buy what you're selling. That is a reflection of your marketing. Something about the way you are communicating yourself and your product out to the world is attracting these broke people to you. And this is why you're having so many conversations with people who do not have money and cannot afford your product. So instead of just uh, getting mad at the world and pounding your fist into a, a concrete wall, being mad about all these broke people you're dealing with, ask yourself, what about my marketing is causing broke people to come around me? This is a question you should ask yourself. It's a good question. And if you can answer it, then you can solve it. It's a very good question to ask. This is a reflection of your marketing. Something about your marketing is drawing these people to you. Now, they are not finding you randomly. They are drawn to you for a reason. So what you need to do is fix your marketing so that you can talk to higher quality prospects. And usually, let me offer you a, a hint, something you should understand before you even do this, is that usually there are fewer of them, but they are of higher quality. So you'll actually be doing less work and you're talking to higher quality people. It, it seems paradoxical, but it's the truth. And the challenge for a lot of us, especially when you're in sales, is that we tend to overvalue effort and not value the quality of where that effort is going. So you have to be careful with this. And there are times to put in a ton of effort and get a ton of quantity. You want to do that quantity. You want to do that. But at the same time, I mean, ton of quality, excuse me. But at the same time, you want to make sure you are continually editing and updating the quality of what you're doing so that you can do a quantity of the quality stuff, not just a quantity of stuff, period, and hoping that some quality just falls through the cracks. All right, that's the random game. You don't want to play that game, at least not for too long. Point number three. Today's topic, once again, is the keys to your sales process. Who exactly should you sell to? Number three, sell to people who are already winners and already winning. Sell to winning people. And do not sell to losers and people who are consistently, perpetually losing. Sell to winners, not losers. What do I mean by this? Well, what does it mean to you? What does it mean when I say sell to winners and not losers? All right. How many of you, any of you who's in sales, actually, you already know exactly what I'm talking about because you have made sales to winners and you know what they look like. You know what it feels like to sell to a winner. You know what it feels like to service, to service the account of someone who is a winner who has come into your world because they bought from you. You know what that feels like and you probably enjoyed it or hopefully you are still enjoying it. And you also know what it feels like to sell to a loser, a person who is like, you know what? And you're looking back on that situation and saying to yourself, I did make this much money from this person, but you know what? That money wasn't even worth it because I had to deal with that person. 
So all of you know what I mean when I say sell the winners and not losers. You determine what that is for you and in your business and sell more to the winners. You want to sell to people who are already successful and already on the path to success. Why is this? Because people who are already successful tend to replicate their past. Uh, number one indicator of future behavior is past behavior. People who have been winning up to this point tend to keep winning in the future. People who have been losing up to this point tend to keep losing in the future. Now, are there exceptions to this? Yes. Some winners become losers. Some losers become winners. However, let's remember that exceptions prove the rule. They do not dispute. They do not refute the rule. Dispute is not a word. I don't think it is. If it is, I made it up. People tend to repeat their past behavior. Okay? People are creatures of habit, all humans, including you. And people who already have successful habits will tend to continue to use those habits. It's much easier to help a successful person maintain their success than it is to help an unsuccessful person become a success. Shall I say that one again? Let me say it again. It is much easier to help a successful person maintain their success than it is to help a unsuccessful person become a success. You are better off working with the successful. It just tends to be a better long-term plan. Now, there are some caveats to this, as I said. I already told you two of them. Now, another thing is this. Helping a person who is unsuccessful become successful, if you are able to pull it off, if you don't listen to my advice here and you, have, you happen to pull it off, it is a bigger turnaround, so to speak, than helping a successful person continue success. Like there, the difference between a successful person's past and present might only be a 5% difference, but it's worth it to them. Again, value decision, not a price decision. Whereas a person who's unsuccessful helping them become successful may be an 80% difference between where they were and where you helped them get to. So it is a bigger turnaround, which might make you look like more of a superhero and it will better feed your ego. However, let's remember this. You must consider that a person who is currently losing may not be in a position to buy from you in the first place because if they are losing, that might be why they can't afford to pay you. Or they simply don't have the resources. So while that fantasy sounds good, does it actually match reality? And usually the answer is no. Here's the other thing. If you have a hero complex, you may feel more accomplished to help a person who is losing and turn them into a winner. It just helps you feel like a bigger and better person or bigger and better whatever you call yourself. The problem with this is it's hard to change another person's habits, no matter how much of a genius you are individually. And this is the challenge that many of you have out there. Many of you have this uh, God complex or hero complex or mother or father complex. You see someone who is severely losing and you know you could help them and you want to help them and you try to give everything you can to help that person. And you still are unsuccessful to the point that you may even start questioning yourself when the problem is you should have never tried to help them in the first place because losers tend to keep losing and winners tend to keep winning. This is just a reality of life. Any of you ever heard the saying, the rich get richer and the poor get poor? This is why. I just told you why. Because people are creatures of habit. And people who are poor tend to keep doing poor things that keep them poor. And people who are rich tend to keep doing rich things that keep them rich. Now, again, are there exceptions? Yes, there are. But the exceptions do not refute the rule. The exceptions prove the rule. The more times, every time you see an exception, the fact that you notice that is an exception is more proof that there's a rule. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? You cannot change another person's stripes if they don't want to change their stripes. You cannot make anybody change. You can influence their change. You can set an example of the change. You cannot make them change. No matter how good you are at what you do, it is impossible. If someone tends to change their outcomes in the process of working with you, that is because they wanted to and you helped facilitate it. That's how it happens. And that's not discrediting what you do, but it is how it happens. You can't make somebody want to change. Again, you can influence, you can set an example, but you cannot make it happen. This is why you're better off working with people who are already successful because, number one, they already know successful habits, which means it will, be, it will much, be much easier for them to adapt to what you want them to do. They are more apt to listen to what you're going to share because you're going to share success habits, which they already have the foundation of. And they, are, they got into your thing based on the value that you bring to the table, not based on you needing to save them from their own selves, which is a lot less work emotionally, mentally, and you no know, tangibly. And you don't have to change these people because they're already moving in the direction that you will want them to move is a much easier job to do. All right, it's much easier for Phil Jackson to coach Michael Jordan than it is to coach some bum guy who nobody ever heard of. Why? Because Michael Jordan was already on a path to success. All, Phil just had to kind of direct him a little bit. He didn't have to make him be successful. All right, there's a reason why Phil Jackson chose the Chicago Bulls as, as a coach. All right, he could have coached 
a whole bunch of other teams. Why do you choose Chicago Bulls? They had Michael Jordan on the team. All right, pretty smart move by Phil Jackson. All right, it's a much easier job that way. Let's recap today's class, which is sales keys. Again, this is going to be a two-part series, so this is part one. People who you should sell to. Number one, sell to people who have money. Sell to people who are rich. Sell to people who have plenty of uh, financial resources. Do not sell to people who are broke because, again, it would be a strain on you. It would be a strain on that relationship. It would be a strain on your resources. It would be a strain on your mind. It will be a strain on your spirit dealing with these people. It is not worth it. Even if you're able to get money out of them, it is usually not worth it. You will probably, in the long run, regret selling to them in the first place. Number two, sell to people who buy based on value, not based on price. This is usually connected to the first point. People have money. They can make a value judgment. They don't have money. They have to make a price judgment. You don't want people who are buying on price unless you happen to be Walmart. And if you're selling high touch, meaning you are working with people consistently, even after the sale transaction has happened, usually you're not at Walmart prices. And if you are, you need to fix that immediately. Come to work on your game university. I'll help you and get you out of that rat race, which you don't want to win. And number three, sell to people who are already winning, people who are already winners and they already have winning successful habits, not to losers, thinking that you're going to turn them around and change them. Even if you do, it takes you too much of your own resources, taxes you in order to do it. And most of the time you won't do it. You will fail. Better off to work with people who are already winning. They will appreciate you more. They will listen to you more. They already have many of the habits that you need them to have already installed and in place. And they will achieve even more success, which actually makes you look better than you trying to do a big turnaround job on some bum who is already going nowhere and you're going to try to make them go somewhere. All right, changing another human being's habits is a job that I would not sign up for. So again, take my word for it if you want, or you can learn the hard way if you so choose. All that said, text me. Get in my text community. Once we start sending those messages again, you'll be getting them. Numbers down below. And work on your game university.com. If you want to learn how to sell to the right people, how to go through your sales presentation, how to actually make a sales presentation that is structured and organized. I was just talking to a, a member of my program just about this the other day. If you want to learn how to do this and do it the right way so that you are systematically and strategically building your business, go to work on your game university.com. Schedule a time to get on a call with us. We'll talk to you about uh, what you're doing, where you want to go, what's in your way, and if you feel like we can help you and that you'd be a good fit, we'll tell you how it works. Go to work on your game, Work on your game. Dre all.